Hello, welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shebert. Natse. Paul Halier served as the Canadian Minister of Defence in the 1960s, shaping the country's armed forces for years to come. It was only in his retirement that he says he made a life-changing discovery. He became the first cabinet-level politician from a G8 country to publicly state that there is extraterrestrial life present on Earth. Is this an elaborate fantasy or aliens science fiction? Or is there something to claims of their existence? Extraterrestrial life. For ages, humanity has wondered, is there anything else in the cold darkness of space? Skeptics say there is no proof, but there have always been those who dared to dream. And some even claim to have seen things with their own eyes. Do aliens exist? Are they already here? Do they pose a threat or a chance for salvation? Honorable wow. Paul Hallier, former Minister of Defense of Canada, and, and he believes that life forms from space exist and are present on Earth. It's great to have you with us on our show. Why do you say that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying over our heads? Well, because I know that they are. <clears throat> they've been, um, as a matter of fact, um, they've been visiting our planet for thousands of years. And one of the cases that would interest you most, if you give me two or three minutes to answer, is uh, during the Cold War, 1961, there were about 50 UFOs in formation flying south from Russia to the, across Europe. And the uh, Supreme Allied Commander was very concerned um, and about ready to press the panic button when they turned around and went back over the North Pole. So they decided to do uh, an investigation and they investigated for three years, and they decided that um, with absolute certainty that four species, four different species, at least, had been visiting this planet for thousands of years. So that's, uh, we have a long history of UFOs, and of course, there's been a lot more activity in the last uh, few decades since uh, uh, we invented the atomic bomb and uh, they're very concerned about, uh, about that and the fact that uh, we might use it again. And because the whole cosmos is a unity and it affects not just us but other people in the cosmos, they're uh, very much afraid that we might be stupid enough to uh, start using atomic weapons again and this would be very bad for us and uh, for them as well. So no serious scientist has ever publicly confirmed evidence of an encounter with extraterrestrials. Why would scientists not confirm the facts if they exist? I'm, I'm afraid they must go out of their way to, not to find out. Because if they did, you know, even 10% of the amount of research I've done in the last eight years, they would be as convinced as I am. I mean, they could do it even faster. Uh, might take them a little longer when they didn't have a military background. But uh, there are so many wonderful books that tell these, these stories and, uh, and they've been authenticated. The, the sightings have been authenticated by uh, more than one witness and also by radar. And they have landed in various places around the world, including Russia. Uh, there's a famous case there. I can't remember the name of the place, but it was, it was widely reported at the time. A man wrote a book about it. And then the French bought the book rights so that it wouldn't be circulated around uh, and uh, th there's just so much evidence uh, if anybody will take the time off to do a little bit of uh, research and study but people just are you know some people are interested and will take the time and the others just say oh you know it's uh, it's uh, just fantasy mm -hmm. but I've <laughs> since I've been uh, public on this subject I get uh, oh probably three or four emails a week from all over the world from people who have actually witnessed sightings and some of them who have actually been on the ships and some of them who have actually been transported to another uh, planet. And so this information is not, you know, it is, it is top secret in a way that the governments aren't talking about it. But if you listen to the whistleblowers and the people who have worked in the industry, and uh, who know what is going on, there is just a lot of information out there and it doesn't take very long to get your hands on it. 
But see, the problem is that some people who report UFO sightings and alien abductions have been shown to make things up and uh, the, to, to make things up to be famous, to make money, or just for a prank. How do we tell fiction from a fact? Well, you have to you have to spend a lot of time trying to find. Uh, we used to say separating the wheat from the chaff, and uh, takes a lot of effort. Um, when I was minister, I got sighting reports, and um, when we ch we checked them out, about 80 percent, about eight out of ten, were um, were not real. There were sites of Venus or uh, plasma or you know a dozen of other things. But there were 15 or 20 percent for which there was no explanation, and they were the genuine, unidentified flying objects. The, these things uh, go way back. One of the the uh, conferences I went to was uh, in Las Vegas. Was uh, promoted by a chap who had written a book about crashes, and there were dozens and dozens and dozens of them and many of them very, very well authenticated so that it would be impossible to read all of that evidence and not to uh, come the, to the conclusion that these uh, vehicles were real. Have you ever had your own encounter with aliens? Uh, not an encounter with aliens, no. I have seen a UFO about uh, 120 miles north of Toronto <clears throat> over Lake Muskoka where I have a cottage. And two years ago, last uh, uh, Canadian uh, Thanksgiving, which is October. Uh, my wife uh, decided she wanted to go out and look at the stars. So uh, I'm not much of a night man, but I put on my cap and went out with her. And she looked into the eastern sky, sky and said, there's a star. And I turned around the other way and I said, oh, there's a much brighter one over here. And she looked and it was. And we, we watched it until our necks almost broke for about 20 minutes. And it was, it was definitely a UFO because it could change position in the sky by three or four degrees in three or four seconds. And I checked out, uh, there were no satellites uh, that could do that. The space station wasn't going by and it doesn't, uh, isn't able to move that fast anyway. And there was nothing, no other explanation except that it was the real thing. And two days later, I went down on the dock, <clears throat> got a comfortable chair and watched. It came back almost to the same spot and entertained me for as long as I could take it. And uh, then I went back uh, to the uh, cottage. But it was, it was very interesting because it would drop down in the sky and then it would roar back up. And then it would shift across a few degrees and, uh, and do a circle and come back at a speed which, you know, just astronomical speeds. As you know, they travel very, very fast. So does it just look like a falling star that falls really quickly and then rises ac again? What does it look like? Well, it just looked like a star. It just looks like a star. Right. And I don't know if, you've, if you're a person who has ever read, read the Bible or not, but I think the, uh, the star of Bethlehem is one of God's uh, flying saucers. Mm -hmm. But you also tell me that people write you emails, three to five emails a week, and they've actually been abducted or they have encounters with, with the aliens. Do they actually tell you what these aliens look like? I mean, you know, everyone's interested. What, what, how would I know if I see an alien and if he abducts me? Well, you have, first, the, the first question you have to ask is how many species are there? And uh, I used to think there were, you know, between two and 12. And uh, Apollo astronaut um, uh, Edgar Mitchell, who came to Toronto a, a few years ago and had dinner with us, <clears throat> agreed that it was somewhere between 2 and 12. But the latest reports that I've been getting from various sources are that there are about 80 different species. And some of them uh, look just like us, and they could walk down the street, and you wouldn't uh, know if you ran, you know, walked past one. Um, and they're what we call the Nordic blondes, and also the tall whites, um, who are actually working with the United States Air Force in Nevada, they, uh, they're able to get away with that. They had a couple of their ladies dressed as nuns went into Las Vegas to shop, and they weren't detected. And I have a friend who saw one of the men walking along the street, and he, somebody who would recognize uh, uh, that they were different, and he did. So they're those kind, and then there are the, the short grays, as they're called, 
and they're the ones that you see in most of the cartoons. They very, have very, very slim arms and legs, and they're very short, just to, you know, a little over five feet. And they have a great big uh, torso and, uh, and a, great big, a great big head and, and great big brown eyes. But <clears throat> they're, they're different species, so you have to, uh, to know that they're different species and, it's, uh, and, and know that they're all different. Mm -hmm. So, so one, uh, if, you, if you saw the short gray, if you saw the short grays, you'd certainly know that there was something up that you'd never seen before. But if you saw one of the Nordic blondes, well, you'd probably say, oh, I wonder if she's from, uh, from Denmark or, uh, or somewhere, you know. So this species that you're describing, are, are they all different in terms of nice and mean? Uh, are some of them nice and benevolent? Are others nasty? Or, 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 or how are they? Are, they? are they good to people on Earth, or are they here to harm them? Well, they're, it's a difficult question to answer because they're, they have different agendas. And maybe all of us on Earth have this, should have the same agenda, but you couldn't say maybe that, that Russia and China and the United States all had the same agenda at every, every turn because they don't. And I would say that nearly all are benign, they're benevolent, they want to help us. There may be one or two species which do not. And uh, that's one of the things I'm investigating at the moment is to see who they are and what they're up to and uh, what their agendas really are. All right, we're talking to Paul Hellier, former Canadian Minister of Defence, who says extraterrestrial life forms exist and are present on Earth. We'll talk more about what they are and why they're here after a short break. Stay with us. to Antarctica, the crew of the Academic Fyodorov face many challenges. Here you have to look out for yourself. Crashing onto rocks, trapped in pack ice, in extreme conditions, anything can happen. Antarctica always comes up with surprises. You have to keep your eyes open because there's always something going wrong. The ship carries huge reserves of water, food, fuel, as well as helicopters and people able to survive extreme conditions. They're ready for anything even an apocalypse. She's really an incredible ship. Calling all Antarctica stations. This is Akademik Fyodorov. Radio check. Please respond. Unexplored Antarctica. What is it in this icy expanse that attracts the people who come here? Now I only go to the dacha. <laughs> and Antarctica. A new generation of polar explorers is coming. We have a new group of specialists here now. All of them are young. How are they going to get along with each other? I don't know. Who are they? I used to be a bureaucrat. Seriously. What adventures await in this mysterious land? Where do they live? What do they eat? And what are they actually doing in Antarctica? Twelve months of change. The moments which redefine the world we live in. RT was there to bring you the full picture. Clash with the police. The police are holding their ground. You and boy, to close a camp that is a dark spot on America. Build the barricades which the police had taken down. In on New Year's Eve, Eve, our global team of reporters and contributors revisit the key events of 2013 and outline what to expect next. Join Anissa Nawi and Kevin Owen for our annual two-hour news special. Start 2014 with RT.
back with Paul Halley, your former Canadian Minister of Defence, to talk about extraterrestrial life forms. Great to have you back. So, these extraterrestrial creatures, where did they come from and how did they get here to Earth? They come from ver various places. For a long while, um, I only knew about ones who came from different star systems. Um, the Pleiades and uh, Reta Reticula and uh, several other star systems, but in the last few months I have met people who have made me aware of uh, that there are some in our star system and that there are actually extraterrestrials um, who live on a, a planet called Andromedia, which is one of the moons of Saturn, and that there are others on, uh, on Venus and some on Mars and uh, that uh, they may be interacting between themselves. I suspect that they are because there is what is called a federation of, uh, of these people and they have rules. For example, one of the rules is that they don't interfere in our affairs unless they're invited to. And uh, that's one of the reasons uh, probably that we haven't seen more of them uh, until very recently. And. Uh, so but what do you mean? There are a lot of people who want to interact they, with them. There are a lot of people who actually want to see them and know who they are. Uh, what they need a special invitation to inter interact with us? W what does it mean? They don't want to I, interfere into I our think affairs. They have to, well, they, they don't want to tell us how to run our affairs. They have, have accepted the fact this is our planet and that we have the right to run it. But um, they're very, very concerned. They, they don't think we're good stewards of our planet. We're not, uh, we're cutting, uh, clear cutting our forests and we're uh, polluting our rivers and our lakes and we're dumping sewage in the oceans and we're doing all sorts of things which are not what good stewards of their homes should be doing and they don't like that and they've made it very clear and as a matter of fact, they have given us a warning. How? And this has come from more than one source. What, how have they um, made it clear? Well, what have they done? They have talked to uh, people. Uh, one of the chaps I talked to about a month ago was, uh, was interacting with them in 1974, he and his brother in Peru, and uh, they were taken to Andromedia, uh, teleported, and, uh, and they were told uh, what the people there think and uh, that we're really uh, wrecking our planet and in fact that something dreadful is going to happen to it if we don't smarten up and change our ways. We spend too much time fighting each other, we spend too much money on military expenditures and not enough on feeding the poor and, uh, and looking after the homeless and the sick and uh, that we are uh, polluting our, our waters and our air and that we're playing around with these uh, exotic weapons uh, thermonuclear weapons and uh, atomic, we atomic weapons which have such a devastating effect both on our Earth and on other areas in the cosmos and, uh, and they don't like that. And that's the reason they would like to work with us to teach us better ways but uh, only, I think, with our consent. And they work through individuals and they try and pick out individuals who won't be frightened to death of them. Mm -hmm. because they can give you quite a fright. Uh, one of the cases I'm familiar with was the, the tall whites in Nevada where the United States Airmen working with them uh, you know, were just frightened to death of them. And one, Charles Hall, uh, rescued the daughter of one of the high up uh, people in the, in the tall whites and as a result became very good friends with the mother and, uh, and as soon as they could trust each other, they had a wonderful relationship. But, and he wrote a book about it, it's called uh, Millennial Hospitality. Mm -hmm. Millennial Hospitality. And uh, it's, it tells you how you go through these stages of being scared out of your wits. But then as, when you establish a trust and a working relationship, why you can have the same relationship, uh, same kind of relationship that you would have with someone here on Earth. But here's what I'm thinking. If you're outing their presence, which is clearly not what they want since they're hiding, why aren't they, you know, why aren't they so afraid of, why aren't you afraid of repercussions? Because you're obviously stating that they're here among us well, and I'm you're telling me all the species that exist. 
that they are here among us, and I'm not afraid because in most cases, uh, well, as far as uh, technology is concerned, they're light years ahead of us, and we have learned a lot of things from them. A lot of the things that we use today, we got from them, uh, you know, uh, uh, lead lights and uh, microchips and uh, Kevlar uh, vests and uh, all sorts of things that we got from their technology and we could get a lot more too especially in the fields of medicine and agriculture if we would uh, if we would go about it peacefully but um, I think maybe some of our people are, are more interested in getting their their military technology and I think that's that's wrong I think that's wrong headed and that's one of the things that uh, that we're going to have to change because we're going to have to work together talking about uh, all of us everywhere on the planet you mentioned military technology and swapping technologies and barters between inter uh, in, in between aliens and uh, people in American government I want to ask you as a former Minister of Defense of Canada is interstellar war a possibility should we be creating a Star Wars force to defend ourselves from possible invasion or something like that well, I think it's a possibility, but it's a possibility, especially if we uh, if we shoot down every uh, UFO that comes in our in our airspace without asking who they are or what they're what they want. And right from the beginning, we started scrambling planes and trying to shoot them down, but their technology was superior enough that we weren't able to uh, get away with it. Uh, certainly not uh, for a long while. And during that period of time, they could have taken us over without any trouble if they'd wanted to. So uh, I, th I think we have to, uh, rather than develop our own Star Wars, Earth Star Wars, to, uh, to protect ourselves against them, that we should, we should uh, work with the benign uh, species, who are the vast majority, and, uh, and work together and rely largely on them, of course, and cooperate so that the, we would be uh, contributing something at the same time, but uh, I don't think there's any, any point in us uh, developing a, a galactic uh, force that um, w would tempt us to go out on our own and get into mischief, which is one of the things I think some of them are concerned about. But what do you expect to happen if people start to believe in alien existence on Earth? Because things are definitely going to change. Our lives aren't going to be the same anymore. Well, I hope that's the case. I, I hope that's the case, and I'm uh, I'm all for full disclosure, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to push very hard for a full disclosure in the book I'm writing, and to give some reasons for it, uh, things that we really have to know and uh, have a right to know, and that our future as a species, and here I mean you know all of the species on the world in the world, um, are potentially at risk if we don't figure out what's going on and work together to uh, to try and make life more uh, amenable for all of us but it's and uh, to work with our neighbors from other planets as well but still like I'm thinking to myself if they've been here for such a long time as you say um, and they're interested in, in helping humanity as you say why is our world such a mess I mean if you want to help someone you just help someone you don't That's wait me. that someone to invite you to help that someone no well, I don't, you know, it's something that you, I think parents can sometimes uh, say to their children, um, this is what you should do. But that doesn't mean the children are going to do it, does it? Because the, the, the cosmos is based on free choice. And we can, we're, we're given the option of making mistakes, of making wrong choices. And I guess, what bothers some of us is we've made too many wrong choices and not enough right choices. So we're going to have to start switching our priorities and stop uh, spending so much time and effort in weapons to kill each other or to dominate each other and spending a lot more time on how to help each other to have a better life uh, and a more just uh, society and a, a life which is healthier and where the health care is better and and where the food distribution is better and, uh, and where the air is cleaner and the water is cleaner and all of those things that are waiting to be done 
if we just uh, get together and, uh, and ro row, as we say, rowboat, row in the right direction, the same direction. And that's possible, but uh, it's a tall order, and so far we haven't done it. My thesis will be that we have to do it, and we have to start doing it right away. Thank you so much for this interesting interview and insight on extraterrestrial life. That was Paul Halier, former Canadian Minister of Defence, who says aliens exist and live among us on Earth. That's all the time we have for today. I will see you in the next edition of Sophie & Co.